Who creates the monsters under our beds? Who tears us down? Who stops us doing the things we love doing? Who creates the stumbling blocks that trip us over and over again? We do. We're our own worst critics. We cause dramas where there are none, and instead of, instead of celebrating our successes, we criticize ourselves for the things that we didn't do perfectly. Why is this? Because we're afraid, and it's far easier to stay hidden behind the sofa than it is to come out and face the demons that are often just figments of our own imagination. In the wilderness, I've seen fear bend and break people, but I've also seen unexpected heroes rise, people who found the courage and the ability to overcome their fear and achieve a goal, summiting a Himalayan peak or surviving for weeks on end in the jungle. What if I told you that just like these people, you too could become the hero of your own life? I'm a survivalist and wilderness guide. I guide private expeditions to some of the world's most exciting environments. I'm also partly responsible for setting up and running the safety on some of the biggest adventure shows on TV. I've literally been dropped into environments with just the clothes I'm standing in, and a knife or a machete, and a medical pack, just in case, um, and had to look after contributors in these environments. At times, I'll hunt and gather and trap for them and meet their basic priorities of survival, fire, food, shelter, and water. It's incredible in these situations that, that stepping off into that world is, is just amazing. I've been shot at. I've been chased by large predators, like huge animals. Um, I've been caught in the crossfire between warring tribes. I've been avalanched in many more exciting situations. I know the power fear holds over us. I also know that incredible feeling when you overcome it. So what is fear? Fear is actually pretty cool. It's a survival mechanism. It's what keeps us alive. If we didn't feel fear, we wouldn't survive very long. It allows us to understand risk. And heights, for example, if we didn't understand the risk of heights, would mean we'd just go merrily wandering off the edges of these cliffs and fall to our death. The human species would not last very long in these situations. The problem is, that I've seen, is that fear and anxiety are becoming chronic conditions um, in everyday life. It seems like that animalistic brain, which to our ancestors helped them stay alive, like fear readied their bodies to run or hide. You know, if they wandered off by themselves, they might get lost. You know, they were safer as a community. Or being stalked by a large predator like a saber-toothed tiger. You know, fear kept them alive. But what I realized sort of, from working and guiding people in the wilderness is that the brain struggles to differentiate between these real life and death threats versus, for example, giving a TED talk or a scary movie or you know, this fear of missing out. You know, and the, the fear of missing out is becoming a huge issue. It's a very real issue as well. It's that feeling that somebody's got better, something better than you or knows something more than you do or they're living a better life than you. And this is where social media plays to this fear. You know, we all have that horrible knotted feeling when we see these perfect pictures of our friends' lives on social media. You know, it's that kind of itch you can't quite scratch. You know, it's the first thing maybe you look at in the morning is your Facebook feed, see how many likes you've got, see how many likes your friends have got in comparison. You know, it might be the last thing you do at night before you go to bed as well, even though you don't really want to do it and you know that it has an impact on you. So what happens to the body when we experience fear? And we all know this, we all have this feeling. It's that feeling when somebody jumps out on you. When the brain is under threat, this whole this chain reaction goes off inside there, and it triggers the release of hormones such as um, adrenaline and cortisol. And these go rushing around the body, like when somebody jumps out on you, you all get that feeling. And this goes rushing around the body, and it triggers, it makes your heart beat faster. Now, it sends the blood rushing to the muscles, ready to run or fight. It gets your body ready for those situations. 
And this is why you know, sometimes you get those that tunnel vision as well, which kind of makes it hard to focus on things, that sort of blurriness at the edge of your, edges of your vision. Once the threat is over, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and calms the body down. The problem is, going back to the issue that, you know, that it's now becoming a chronic condition, is that the brain struggles to switch itself off. You know, we're bombarded with these social media images by you know, sort of overwhelming everyday life threats, which the brain, as I said, can't, struggles to distinguish between the real life and death versus this fear of missing out. And the brain stays switched on. You know, it keeps releasing those hormones, and we get these chronic conditions starting. And you know, there's conditions that have been related to stress, things like um, autoimmune diseases, gluten intolerances, um, even things like acne and depression. These are all linked, potentially, back to stress. So how do we learn to control this and become the hero of our own lives? Stop. Stop, think, observe, plan. When I'm teaching survival skills, I teach the rule of threes, which is based on the American military training system, um, which is a generalized rule of survival. It basically says that, um, in general, the human body can survive for three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. I tend to add two more to this. The first one is three months without company. We're tribes people. We're designed to live as a community. You know, we need other people. Otherwise, we tend to go what old-time fur trappers would call going bushy, which is where we go a little bit mad from spending too much time alone. And the second one is three seconds without thinking. I see this over and over again in dangerous environments, where people switch off their brain for, three, for a few seconds, and this is when accidents happen. This is why more accidents happen on the way down from an epic summit than on the way up. The mountaineer has achieved their goal. That mountain has been playing in their mind for days, weeks, months, potentially even years, and they've reached that goal. Weirdly, returning home safe or returning back to base camp is rarely the driving factor. I had a, had a guy in, on an Arctic expedition. Um, it was sort of working, and it was minus 50 uh, chill factor. Uh, up there, and he was, um, he was chopping some wood with an axe, and he was busy sort of cutting away, um, and stuck the axe in his foot, <laughs> which triggered a 12-hour evacuation to get him out of there. But this, and in hindsight, what he told me was that he'd, he'd got distracted by these snowflakes, these beautiful snowflakes falling onto his sleeve. And this just gets, goes to show that even when you're doing something really dangerous, the mind wanders and switches off. When I'm teaching navigation, um, I use that STOP acronym, that Stop, Think, Observe, and Plan. Um, when, when working with Duke Vedema groups or beginner navigators, I always encourage them that if they become geographically embarrassed, is to stop and brew themselves a cup of tea or coffee um, and have a drink. I find that in this, in this time, when they can actually calm their bodies down, and they go through that process of brewing their drink and having it. It gives the brain time to calm back down, and logical reasoning kicks back in, which prevents them from becoming even more geographically embarrassed and wandering off into the wilderness where we then have to go looking for them. Um, I recently read a, a newspaper article when I was out in the US um, about a hiker whose body had recently been found after several years of being missing. Next to her body, they found a journal that said that she had, she'd wandered off the path to go to the toilet. And on finishing her business, she couldn't find her path again. Now, I don't know this hiker, and I don't know the full circumstances, so this is by no means a judgment of her. But imagine yourselves in that position. Imagine that you've been hiking off in the wilderness, and you've wandered off the path to go to the toilet. Realistically, how far away are you from that path? 50 foot to 100 foot? It's not very far. You finish your business, pull your trousers up, you go wandering off. After a couple of minutes of walking, you realize that you've missed your path. It's in that moment that fear strikes. You're genuinely at risk. You know, the, you're out in the middle of nowhere. You're on your own. You've got no mobile phone signal. 
It's in this moment where that fear strikes, that rush of adrenaline that goes through the body, and where this reflex action occurs, which for some people may be freeze, but for others it's like running around like a headless chicken, sort of wildly out of control. But it's in that moment where it's key to become the hero of your life and stop. Stop there, get out your GPS, your compass, your map, allow the brain to calm back down again before you then act. This will allow the brain time to actually come up with a logical plan, which might be that you then do a logical sequence of searching, which will then put you back onto your path. So how do you train the hero and how do you stay switched on? So I use a technique called scenario planning. And for me, scenario planning is, has several different uh, sort of factors. Um, I realized when I sort of wrote my book, Mind vs. Fiverr, that resilience um, can be trained. You know, the traits that make up resilience can be trained, and anybody can learn them. Some people are more predisposed to them, but, other, but anybody can learn these things. Um, and the way that you do that is through exposure to lots of different experiences. So when those opportunities arise, say yes more, push yourselves out of your comfort zone more. You know, facing more challenges gives yourself self-confidence and more confidence to face life head-on and succeed. The second one is, this, is that with the scenario planning, is that I, it's something that I do all the time when I'm guiding. It's like I'm wandering along the paths and I'll be imagining that my clients fall off. How am I going to rescue them? How am I going to save them? Um, you know, down to downright crazy things like, what would I do if an alien spaceship fell out of the sky right in front of me? And this has two, gives me two reasons for doing this. The first one is that it keeps my brain switched on, it keeps it active. When I've been guiding for weeks on end out in the jungle, I'm covered in mosquito bites, I'm itchy, I'm tired. You know, I need to keep my brain switched on, and this keeps my brain ready and prepared for the unexpected. And the second reason that I do this is so that I'm, I'm tricking my mind, similar to the visualization process that athletes use, I'm tricking my brain into believing that I've done this time and time again before. So you take these things and use them in everyday life. It's not wrong to imagine yourself as the hero of your life. Run it through in your head. You know, and the next time that incredible opportunity comes up that you might have turned down before because you were scared, will give you the confidence because your brain thinks it's already done it before. So as you guys go on to the next stage of life and into the future, ask yourself these questions. Who has the power of change? Who allows us to feel the happiness we deserve? And who holds the key to your future? Thank you.